Hi, I'm Steve Clements, and I have a question. As hunger spreads in Gaza and Israel ignores a Security Council resolution calling for a ceasefire, where is this war heading? Let's get to the bottom line. For months, Israel has been threatening to destroy the last Palestinian city in the Gaza Strip still standing, and that's Rafah. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu did a U-turn after initially canceling his delegation's visit to Washington and then rescheduling those meetings to discuss his plans for Rafah. The reason for the cancellation? Israel was angered when the Biden administration didn't veto a U.N. Security Council resolution calling for a ceasefire during the month of Ramadan, which is almost over. And immediately after the resolution passed, the U.S. said it wasn't binding anyway. So with Israel still talking about total victory, the daily killing continues and starvation of Palestinians is widespread. And with only vague prospects for temporary ceasefire, where is the war in Gaza heading? Today we're talking with Kenneth Roth, the former head of Human Rights Watch and now a visiting professor at Princeton University. Ken, it's great to see you. You've long been at the helm of, I would call, the conscience of at least America and much of the world when it comes to looking at human rights violations and pointing them out and shining a spotlight on them. What do you see in Gaza today? Well, you know, it's a devastating situation, I think, as we all know. And, you know, sadly, this is not just an unfortunate consequence of war. This is a deliberate strategy on the part of the Israeli government. And what everybody's focusing on foremost now is Netanyahu's starvation strategy. Um, that was the subject of the International Court of Justice's um, new ruling this week. And, you know, what we've seen is that the Israeli government, you know, lets in drips and drabs of aid, um, is trying to prevent large-scale death, but it's not letting in anywhere near enough aid to prevent large-scale hunger, starvation, and as a, a new UN report has just found, imminent famine. And so, you know, that's um, the immediate concern, but of course that's part of a larger strategy in which the Israeli government seems to be collectively punishing the civilian population of Gaza for the horrible crimes of Hamas on October 7th. And we've seen this in the indiscriminate bombardment, the you know, decimation of broad neighborhoods in Gaza, um, the disproportionate attacks going after you know, what might be military targets, but using things like 2,000 pound bombs that just utterly destroy neighborhoods and, and kill many civilians. So this has been you know, a pattern, really a war crime pattern, um, that is what gave rise to the initial International Court of Justice's ruling that there plausibly is genocide here and orders to the Israeli government to take steps to prevent that. And we're not seeing the kind of um, positive response to that ruling that we would have hoped to have. In your lifetime, Ken, have you ever seen anything like this in which so many uh, members of a population have been dislodged? It's nearly the entire country. You have the entire northern part of Gaza destroyed and flattened. Uh, much of the rest uh, uh, is underway. You've had the swelling of the population of Rafa go from about 300,000 people to over 1.4 million people right now. And it's now very much in the, in the, in the gun hairs, if you will, of uh, both Israeli, and I need to add, because I want to ask you about it later, but American military planners that may become a part of that action in Rafa. Uh, and so I'm just wondering, have you seen something like this happen with cameras going, with media reporting it, and the world watching? I'm just, it's, it's astounding. Well, I mean, yes and no. I think we have to recognize that there are other militaries that have deliberately targeted civilians. You know, that's what the Syrian and Russian militaries did in Syria. That's what Putin did in Chechnya. So we do have examples like that. We, of course, you know, have... Um, the genocide in Darfur, the, the, the genocide in Rwanda. Um, what I think makes Gaza exceptional, and, and you're alluding to this, is both the speed of what has happened and the percentage of the population affected. Because, you know, I would say, what is a, a quarter or three quarters of the population has um, been forcibly displaced. Um, there is about a third, say 35% of the buildings that have been damaged or destroyed. I mean, the, the magnitude and speed of what has happened here, I think, is unprecedented. It's difficult to think back to, you know, any times in, in recent history where something comparable has taken place. The International Court of Justice has now ordered Israel to 
unblock pathways for food and medical supplies. Do you think Israel will in any way um, bend to that order? And what are the implications if it doesn't? Well, first, I mean, let's look at what the court did, because Israel's claim was, we're not blocking aid. You know, we're letting the aid in. What are you talking about? And the court said, you know, you've got to be kidding. And they cited um, UN reports showing both the extent of the starvation, and since the proof is in the pudding, people are just not getting what they need to eat. Um, but they also cited um, reports of humanitarian groups that describe, you know, these blockades on the Gazan border with Egypt and with, with southern Israel. And this has been, you know, widely reported in the media, where, um, you know, Israel using these understaffed, slow inspection processes forced trucks to wait, you know, three weeks before they can enter Gaza. Um, they often, you know, find some tiny little item they claim is dual use. It could be, you know, scissors, it could be, you know, whatever they find, which forces the truck to go back and start all over again. So you put this kind of bureaucratic obstruction together with this enormous need, and yes, you know, they're letting in bits and pieces of aid, but nowhere near what's needed. And so the International Court of Justice said, we, you know, utterly reject your defense, Israel. We find that you are, you know, flouting our original anti-genocide order. You're not letting the humanitarian aid in at scale, as the UN Security Council had ordered. Um, we're going to order you to do this again. Now, you know, Steve, you're asking the right question. What happens if they don't? And, and in fact, Israel you know, already accused South Africa of exploiting the court, exploiting genocide, which, you know, if there's any exploitation taking place here, it's the Israeli government exploiting Palestinian civilians as a war crime method to try to fight Hamas. Um, so Israel's given no indication that it's going to comply, even though an international court of justice ruling is legally binding, it begs the question, who's going to enforce it? And there is, you know, an official and an unofficial answer to that. The official answer is the UN Security Council could order enforcement measures, impose sanctions and the like. That requires getting past the U.S. veto. Biden has shown no indication of, of allowing that. The, the ruling he allowed earlier in the week, um, the, the resolution by the UN Security Council, um, was not a sanctions resolution. It was a, a, a statement in a sense. And so um, that route through the Security Council is probably going to be blocked, even though if the Security Council were to act, it really is all going to come down to one person, Joe Biden. And Joe Biden does have the leverage to force Netanyahu to stop the starvation, to stop the bombing of civilians. And that leverage comes through the massive U.S. military aid, $3.8 billion annually, and the massive ongoing arms sales that permit the Israeli military to continue bombing um, the civilian population, to continue enforcing the blockade. And Biden has shown zero inclination to use that leverage. He, you know, speaks a good game. He says all the right things. He says, you know, stop the starvation, um, take better care to protect civilians, but he never enforces it. And indeed, um, the State Department just recently ruled that Israel is not committing war crimes, which is crazy. I mean, you know, nobody believes that, but it said that because that was a legal prerequisite to allow the arms sales to continue. So, you know, sadly, it does come back to Joe Biden, and Joe Biden is willing to do the rhetorical right thing, but is not willing to take action to, you know, enforce the International Court of Justice ruling, enforce the U.S. Security Council resolution, anything that would stop the killing and the starvation of Palestinian civilians. So what's going on with President Biden? Recently, there was a fundraiser in New York. That fundraiser had former President Obama, uh, former President Clinton, and uh, Joe Biden there. They raised about $26 million for the Democrats. It was disrupted uh, several times by pro-Palestine protesters. But during his talk there, he said Israel's very existence is at stake. And I pay a lot of attention to President Biden's comments. And it wasn't until a meeting with the King of Jordan here in Washington, D.C., King Abdullah, that Joe Biden ever talked at length about Palestinian victims. But here he's talking about Israel, a superpower, and wondering about its very existence. What are your thoughts? Well, you know, it's hard to psychoanalyze Joe Biden. I mean, it's first noting that Israel's existence is not at stake. It's incredibly powerful. October 7th was traumatic because 
Israelis didn't think that Hamas had the capacity even to breach its border and clearly did you know, enormous damage, but it was you know, one day's worth of damage. It never threatened the, the Israeli state. Um, but I think with Biden, there are two things. One is personal. I think he very much identifies with Israel. He still thinks of Israel from the early days. You know, this is where his age shows, you know, when, when Israel was really David against the Goliath of the combined Arab nations. And that's just not the current situation of the, the superpower Israel that continues, you know, for decades to occupy Palestinian territory. But, you know, I think there also has been a political calculation on Biden's part. You know, he's always been focused on the movable middle, the handful of independents that will likely decide November's presidential election. And, you know, I think he kind of took for granted his base, you know, the progressive side of the Democratic Party, figuring, you know, they're not going to vote for Trump. I don't have to worry about them. I'm just going to focus on the, the movable middle. And what he clearly didn't count on, and I, I think the Michigan primary, the uncommitted vote there demonstrates this, is that, you know, some progressive Democrats are just so upset by Biden's green lighting of, of Netanyahu's killing and starvation in Gaza that they may just abstain. You know, they're not going to vote for Trump, but they may just not vote, which is an effective vote for Trump. And so, you know, Biden is beginning to focus on that more. I think that's why he allowed the UN Security Council resolution to pass earlier this week. But he then, you know, undercut himself. And, and you know, immediately his ambassador at the UN, um, the White House spokesperson said, oh, this is a non-binding resolution. Now, that's legally untrue, but the real point is political. He's signaling immediately to Netanyahu don't worry about this. You know, we we had to do this for political reasons, but keep doing what you're doing. And, and you know, that's utterly cynical. I think he hoped that, you know, that his constituents, the progressives, um, wouldn't really notice this technicality about whether a, a Security Council resolution is binding or not. They would just focus on the resolution. But people are not that stupid. They see that, you know, this is just, you know, virtue signaling. But in fact, the reality is Biden is still green lighting and, and worse, really aiding and abetting these war crimes by continuing to provide the military aid and the arms sales. In, in one sense, the question I have is whether or not um, America will have standing in the future to weigh in on human rights, to weigh in on values, to look at China and Xinjiang, look at various abuses, in it, or is it in its apparent complicity with some of the arrangements now in this Israel clients in Gaza, has it lost standing to be a human rights commentator versus other nations in the future? Well, I think, you know, frankly, even before October 7th, um, Biden's human rights policy was just filled with exceptions. And that is because even though, you know, early in his term, he said, I'm going to be guided by human rights and democratic principles. In fact, you know, for the last year, year and a half or more, he's been focused foremost on building global coalitions against China and Russia. And in that process, he's been willing to just close his eyes to terrible atrocities. So, you know, he, he you know, embraces the Saudi crown prince, even though, you know, he's utterly ruthless at home. He embraces Egypt President Sisi, even though he's presiding over the most repressive state in Egypt's modern history. He embraces Modi, you know, even though he's shutting down de um, democracy in India. And so, you know, we've already seen elements of this. Now, I think that, you know, if you kind of take a Kissingerian realist approach, you know, one possible way to get through to Biden is that if he continues, which I think he does, to care about the, the competition with China and Russia, if he continues to care about Ukraine, he is hurting himself by this unequivocal embrace of Israel as it pummels Gaza. Because, you know, governments of the global south that he needs for things like United Nations votes or to enforce sanctions, they're saying, I want nothing to do with this. And if this has nothing to do with values, nothing to do with principles, if it's just a geopolitical competition, I'm going to sit this one out. You know, why is it so important to, to defend Ukraine if, you know, the, the principles that are at stake there, you're just jettisoning them when it comes to Gaza. And so I think that there is a, you know, a realist argument for why these values matter, because, you know, the nations of the world are not dumb. They see through this hypocrisy, and um, the lack of any principle, any even adherence to the so-called rule-based order when it comes to Israel, is going to harm U.S. credibility on other things that Washington cares about. You know, the U.N. Special Rapporteur on Human Rights uh, in the Occupied Palestinian Territories, Francesca Albanese, recently told the U.N. Human Rights Council that there were reasonable grounds 
to believe that Israel is committing genocide with intent. Very, very powerful statement from her. Uh, and there was a remarkable statement from the State Desp uh, Department spokesman, Matthew Miller. Let's listen to it. We have long, for long standing, uh, for a long standing period of time, opposed the mandate of this special rapporteur, uh, which we believe uh, is not productive. And when it comes to the individual who holds that position, I can't help but note um, a history of anti Semitic comments that she has made. But with respect to the um, uh, report itself, we have made clear that we believe that allegations of genocide are unfounded. But at the same time, we have, are deeply concerned by the uh, number of civilian casualties in Gaza, and that's why we have uh, pressed the, the government of Israel on uh, multiple occasions to do everything it can to minimize those civilian casualties. Kenneth, I would love to hear your reactions to Matthew Miller's statement and your view in this kind of tension over classifying what we're seeing unfold uh, on our TV screens as genocide or not. Well, I think this is classic Biden administration double talk. You know, on the one hand, they say, oh, we're concerned about civilian casualties. On the other hand, they try to undercut any serious pressure on Israel to stop. Um, and, and the special rapporteur statement is just the latest example of this. Now, you know, there's a big debate about, you know, is this genocide or not? Um, I should say first that I think this is a bit of a sideshow because um, while, you know, genocide is a horrible concept, it's a terrible crime, um, you know, many people think of it as the worst crime but war crimes are horrible. Crimes against humanity are horrible. And there, it's pretty clear those are taking place. So, you know, that one problem with this focus on genocide is it tends to exculpate Israel for the other crimes that it clearly is committing. Now, you know, is this genocide or not? Um, it's really going to come down to a fairly technical argument of intent. In other words, there are two elements to the crime of genocide as defined by the Convention of the, the International Treaty. Um, one are a series of acts, including um, killing, including um, rendering conditions of life unbearable and tolerable. Um, the magnitude of what's happening in Gaza pretty clearly meets that act part of the standard. So it all comes down to intent. You know, is Israel acting with the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group? And, you know, the International Court of Justice said there's a plausible case to be made here, citing, you know, a series of statements by senior Israeli officials. You know, President Herzog, who said there are no uninvolved civilians, or Defense Minister Gallant, who referred to human animals, you know, not just Hamas, but anybody affected by the siege. In other words, the entire civilian population of, of Gaza. So there are statements like that. Um, on the other hand, you know, some generals are smart enough to say, you know, no, we're just trying to enforce humanitarian law. A lot of this intent argument is going to come down to, you know, reading intent from the actions, you know, from the indiscriminate bombardment, from the disproportionate attacks, from the, the starvation strategy. And, you know, does this add up to intent or not? You know, partly it's going to come down to how the court interprets that. If you look at genocide as a means to an end, that is to say, you know, just kill off enough Palestinians so that you chase them out of Gaza, which is what some of the far-right ministers like Ben Gavir and Smotrich have explicitly asked for. Um, that's one view of genocide. That was sort of what the Myanmar army did to chase Rohingya into Bangladesh. Another view, though, is to say that, you know, genocide has to be the only intent. It can't be a means to an end. It has to be just the final solution. You know, kill anybody you can get your hands on. Um, and that, of course, you know, is, is not what's going on in Gaza right now. So a lot's going to come down to really how does the court view this? Is it enough to see the intent as, you know, one of two or more? Or does it have to be the sole intent? And, and the court's jurisprudence on this has been fairly conservative. If you look back at the Croatia versus Serbia case, it seemed to imply that the intent has to be sole intent, in which case it's not going to find genocide here. But if, um, you know, Israel continues to piss off the court as it's doing now by just flouting its orders, the court may, you know, come to what I think would be a more sensible interpretation of the law, which is to say, you can have multiple intents, one of them can be genocidal, and if that's the standard, Israel's going to be found guilty. Ken, are you heartened at all by the ambivalence that young Democrats and younger Americans have about this conflict? And you can see it in the falling poll numbers of Joe Biden with a lot of youth. Um, you were, I'm going to just be honest with you, you were on, on for a, a fellowship at Harvard, that, that fellowship was rescinded. A lot of people look at it and worried it was your 
forthright comments on this kind of crisis and some of Israel's actions that may have led to the rescission of that invitation to be at Harvard. But I'm just watching within the political realm in the United States, young people don't have the same mindset towards this as President Biden. We also see the black community softening its support for Joe Biden because they look at this as a social and racial justice issue as well. And so I'm just interested, as you kind of look at the U.S. political scene, are you heartened by some of the trends that we see today? Yeah, first, just to, to go back to the Harvard thing, just to kind of fill out the picture. I mean, I was explicitly rejected because of my criticism of Israel. Um, and then um, when there was an outpouring of protest, the dean reversed himself. And indeed, I'm, I'm speaking to you today from Harvard. So um, the fellowship was reinstated and I continue to hold it. Um, now, as for your question, you know, there is a real shift among the younger generation, which, you know, doesn't remember embattled Israel. All they've ever known is the Israel of the occupation, the Israel of apartheid, the Israel of, you know, periodic decimation of, of, um, of, of Gaza. And so these are people who, you know, are becoming the Democratic Party and are clearly challenging this presumption that the Democrats just let Israel do whatever they want. And I think that, you know, even within the American Jewish community, we're seeing, you know, a real shift. You still have, you know, APAC, which, you know, represents do whatever Netanyahu wants. You know, that's um, the kind of conservative part of the American Jewish community, but that's a real minority. And, and what we're seeing is more and more American Jews saying, this is not what my religion stands for. This is what I was, not what I was brought up to value. And they recognize that there is a distinction between this far right Israeli government and Israel. That's a distinction APAC doesn't want you to talk about. But that is a distinction that many Democrats and many you know, Americans now make. Now, interestingly, you know, Netanyahu has basically given up on the American Jewish community. Um, he still you know, embraces APAC, but when he looks to who his constituents are, they're Christian evangelicals. It's the Republican Party. And I think he understands that the Democratic Party is not going to put up with the kind of far right policies that he needs to pursue in order to stay in power. Because, you know, it's not a matter of just, you know, him having a handful of far right ministers. Those far right ministers hold 11 votes in the Knesset, you know, much more than, than the margin of Netanyahu's majority. So he needs to placate the far right in order to stay in power and avoid the corruption prosecution that is underway. And so um, that is a, you know, a recipe for losing the, the Democratic Party and losing you know, a good part of America as we're seeing the polls showing. So you know, I, I suppose you can say it's heartening that I think that this um, you know, blank check that Netanyahu has tended to receive from the US government, that is not a view that is shared by the American people. Joe Biden hasn't come around yet. Well, we'll end it there. Kenneth, thank you so much. Princeton University visiting professor and senior fellow at Harvard University and former president of Human Rights Watch, Kenneth Roth, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So what's the bottom line? Gaza is in the depths of an ongoing nightmare, and even more Palestinians are going to starve and die if there's no change soon in the politics and direction of this conflict. The world watches as one of the world's most important courts monitoring human rights violations ordered Israel to address the famine it has caused in Gaza. But let's face it. Israel can't ignore pressure because it has the U.S. running defense. The U.S. abstention at the U.N. Security Council might have been meant as a message, but we should all remain pretty skeptical that Israel's leadership can read these softball signals. Stopping Israel's war is going to take something bolder than an order from the World Court or a resolution from the U.N. The U.S. has to say it will not be part of a genocide and order Israel to stand down, full stop. Only that will really end this chapter of this conflict. And that's the bottom line.